crossy road, take me home to the place I belong. This is Podkit, episode 48, I'm More Punk Than You, on Sunday, April 28, 2019. And now, fight the proprietary. This episode of Podkit is hosted by Brandon Johnson, Brian Mitchell, and Ryan Rampersat. This episode has show notes at thenexus.tv slash pk48. Hello, hello. Hi, everybody. Hey. Welcome. We Hey, we made it in April, so it's only been a month, right? I think that's how yeah. it works. Pretty much. Is it already April 29th? No, 28th. 28th. Oh, it is. Oh, Phew. I I entered the wrong date in our show notes. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> that's, that's fine. Uh, Nobody will notice. Episode yeah. 48 recorded on April 28th. Perfect. Synergy. If only, yeah. If only there was a 48th day of a month. Well, yeah. that would make the episode uh, duration between episodes much longer. Oh, that's, that's true. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> but still once a month. Yeah, but just much more spaced apart. <laughs> Definitely. Ah, uh, man. Well, we have some interesting topics coming up here. Um, we'll start with, I think, most recently. Um, I was at Mini Bar yesterday, which is a large unconference put on by the Mini Star organization at the Best Buy headquarters here in Bloomington, right? Richfield? Yep. Richfield. Richfield. Like so there were. A bajillion talks over several sessions throughout the day. Um, I'm trying to now remember what I went to. So I went to one on why recruiters suck so bad. Oh, that um, was taught by a recruiter, wasn't it? Or led by a recruiter. Yeah, I think it was his 11th year doing it in a row or something like and that. What was, the, what was their conclusion on that one? Uh, just a, kind of explaining why recruiters work the way they do and, you know, a um, corporate recruiter versus one who just tries to find anyone and then talking a little bit about the job market. Um, He was saying Minneapolis is uh, adjusted for cost of living is the best city to do or work for tech in. Well, that's what they all say, right? Isn't that what they all say? (laughs) Pretty sure that's what he quoted. He quoted some study or survey or magazine or article or something. Yeah. Yes. With pictures that he wrote himself. Wink, wink. (laughs) So I don't know. Paul, Paul's a solid guy. Okay. And he helped set up JavaScript Minnesota last week. He did. Um, okay, so let's see. That was the first session. The second session, uh, I don't even remember what was the second session. The uh, bagels. Bagels were actually before even session zero. Yeah. Oh, uh, what? Yeah, I say the, the keynote was. Um, okay, I need to. I need Sharon to, Kennedy Vickers, right? The CIO of, um, of St. Paul. St. Paul, yeah. Yeah. Really good talk on. Um, you know, designing technology with, um, you know, for all. So, you know, training models and considering all types of people when you're building these things. Um, so that was really good talk. Um, okay. There was one after lunch I went to that was a, uh, rant round table. Nice. And that was pretty fun. There were like 25 people in the room by the end. So it was just, th- you know, 30 seconds to three to five minutes or something. Anyone could just sign up and rant about a topic. So there was from a, a high schooler ranting about random rules in high school to people ranting about positivity. <laughs> and um, the the T character in the ISO 8601 date time format. Um, oh, man. That particular person wanted a space instead of a T. That's fair, I guess. So that was that was just super fun. That's probably my favorite kind of session at Minibar when you just talk to other people and discuss something. Yeah. Um. Yeah, and then I, I skipped on one for true skip conf fashion. There you um, go. And I went to an awesome talk on Apache Kafka um, by Sean Seymour, who I went to school with and I'm friends with. Um, nice. But he, it was a packed room, and it was a super. You know, it, it covered all of the main topics you might be interested in when you're trying to implement and design a more streaming architecture. 
um, through Apache Kafka. Sweet. That was my mini bar, basically. Way cool, way cool. I saw lots of uh, U of M Morris alumni and friends, um, several people from my work. So it was a good time. And then just random people I've met at meetups and whatnot. Awesome. That's great. It was a busy day. For sure. Yeah, I didn't go this year. I'll try to go next year. I went to a friend's wedding instead. So we'll see. Nice. No, I gotcha. I didn't go either. Um, Minibar is always kind of weird for me. And this year I I just decided to nope out because of what always happens, which is uh, um, my allergies always get really awful during the last week of April, first week of May. And guess what? My allergies got really awful during the last week of April, first week of May. So, like, Thursday and Friday, I basically just, like, uh, passed out and napped for, like, six hours. And um, here I am, sounding sounding like a congested John Gruber. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, hopefully a weekend of rest helped with exactly. tackling next week. There's always next year. Somebody, somebody on Twitter asked me whether it was better or worse uh, than last year when there was like a foot and a half of snow Mega on the ground. Mega snow hurricane. Yeah. Not not gonna lie, but actually, like 14 inches of snow last year, it was way easier to <laughs> way easier to get up and move around than the beautiful weather we have here. Oh, huh, isn't that interesting? Darn. Yeah. It's it's only when it's nice out our allergies bad. Those I'll, plants. I'll take the snow any day. I know. Darn it. Yep. Pollen. So, Brian, I heard that you've been using hooks. I've been trying to. Hooked on hooks. Um, so, uh, let's see. Uh, my my application I'm working on is a, you know, it's an analytical application. So, it's presenting data to users, and that data can change through a variety of ways, such as, like, changing a date for a date range to show data for. Um in addition to a bunch of parameters that are outside of the component that you're currently in, affecting that data, um, it can also, or it also is reloading all of the data when the user navigates away from a certain page and back to it, because we want to, you know, show that we're fetching the, the latest data again. I mean, under the hood, we're like all caching it in Redis anyway, but that user experience. Um, so it's currently all implemented in Redux, but it's like hundreds of lines of very similar code across the different parts of the application. Mm-hmm. And we're just invalidating it all the time. Um, I have some functions that wrap the reducers that just um, call the reducer with undefined as a state, which returns the initial state all the time. And so we're not really taking any advantage of it being in a global state. Um, so I'm looking at ways of doing data fetching in line in a component using hooks. Cool. Um, I built out an example using these, this library React request hook. Um, there's an issue with types right now, but I have a pull request out there hoping that gets merged soon. Ayo. Um, so that's seeming to work pretty well, uh, which led me to to building out an example in one part of our application. And then I got to unit testing, and that, that great warning state has been updated outside of an act statement oh yeah that everyone loves to see yep. with asynchronous events with hooks um so i spent like forever really like a day or two trying to test this and i ultimately just upgraded to react 16.9.0 dash alpha dot zero in order to um, better test it with asynchronous functions and that seems to work pretty well so i'm waiting on that to be released as well before i can really use any of this in the app but yeah, so it's, I think it's getting better or it will be getting better pretty soon in the entire React ecosystem. Um, a few other examples I was looking at um, from the React Use um, library, which has tons of community created React hooks. There's a use async function, which does something pretty similar to how React request hook works. Um, and even something like React hooks to Axios can do something similar as well. Nice. So I'm hoping, like, React gets updated soon and this library gets that PR merged. But we will see. Yeah, this is cool. So I, uh, I, for a lot of the smaller things that I do, I will uh, just use use effect and just pull stuff in 
and then yeah. um you know just do whatever i need to do with it uh it, it's, it's kind of cool to use a hook for it i it does spook me that we're so tightly coupling some of the you know async logic for fetching data and the rendering logic but that's kind of what the hook is for yeah i i found that you know with with redux most you know when we added new new area of the application that that fetch data from a new api endpoint you know we we have all this like uh data requested data received data errored yeah. and this common loading error and then data blob state that was being passed all over the place so it was just tons of boilerplate that just different differentiates itself based on which reducer you're in or a property on some object and so switching to pulling it inline and then using a hook so you can abstract away all that common state stuff is really powerful i think yep totally yeah i and think a perfect use for like react generics or typescript generics yeah, that would that would it is perfect for that uh i would like to uh you know i think i think we're still really early on the <laughs> hooks life cycle um <laughs> i think we're really early on that and i think patterns like this haven't fully matured yet especially considering that suspense is still not out yet and when concurrent mode and suspense come out a lot of this will get further refined uh, yeah because those will those those will change uh, a lot of the ways that you do async rendering and you know what loading states feel like for users absolutely yeah i'm excited for that um, ready to throw all those promises. Yep. Yeah. Truly indeed. Cool. Well, I've been working on design systems. You. Have you, have you two heard about design systems? Sure do. A couple of them here and there. Here and there. Yeah. So I, uh, uh about, uh, a month ago I found, um, uh, the United States web design system and they recently had uh, deployed their v2 version of it and I really like what they did here uh, so so USDS is one of the cool places to work in the government I guess um, so one of the th- interesting things about a design system is that it's sort of a combination of CSS framework component library and guiding principles and philosophy Uh so at, at where I work right now, uh, the the business is sort of going through the uh, realization that they have a ton of applications and they have a ton of developers and they're all making stuff in a different way in terms of look and feel. And they would also like to have something that sort of unifies, maybe not 100% of the look and feel because, you know, different things should be different, but that there are some guiding principles and some, you know, uniform components where there can be uniform components. Um, so I've been working on this for a couple of weeks now, although then my couple of weeks in the past two weeks have been very busy and fragmented, so so much for that, mm-hmm. right? Um, so I've been going through some of the other design systems, and so um, some of the other ones that also just came out uh, are the base web React component um, design system from, who is this, Uber. So Uber made all of these nice components for other things, so mm. that's, that's pretty cool. Um and so we've been drawing inspiration from a bunch of stuff. Uh, and, of course, uh, you two just linked the Dropbox one and the... I don't know. who. who what's this carbon one? That's IBM. Ah, uh, IBM. Um, let's close that. <laughs> yeah, let's just let's get that right out of there. Yeah. No, no, um, no leave it there. But just, we're just going to close it. So, yep. so what, I, what I've come to the realization of is, uh, a, a, at least broadly... Uh, design systems are really hard to make and they take forever to make and you can't just say I want one go make one and then have think right. think even think about having it done in a week um, it's a progression of here's a base go use it oh you want that component cool we'll add it to the system and then it's continuous refinement it's not it's not something that just gets made it's something that organically grows Oh, and man, is it a lot of work. Absolutely. Absolutely. Like one of the things that, so the, the Dropbox one in particular is kind of interesting because I'm not actually a hundred percent sure that there's a, I actually don't believe there's a publicly available, um, like toolkit from Dropbox. I think this is really more of like, um, what, you know, 
what they did. And I guess this, this, yeah. So this is kind of a thing that I wanted to mention as as kind of some discussion about this because, like, in the in the public sector, particularly like the USDS is one. Yep. It's very pragmatic, and it's focused around building the component library. Yep. Now the the, the thing that's interesting about this is like. Um, coming at it from like an agency perspective and maybe even like a traditional advertising or design firm perspective, there's like, um, you know, like the, the, the notion of a component library isn't terribly foreign. In fact, on a lot of CMS projects, well, where I would start is like building out that component library. Right. But that component library is kind of coming from, um, the, the designer made a thing. I break it out into components. Yep. Right. Um, whereas this is like, you, kind of like you said, Ryan, you can't just kind of speak it into existence yeah. without understanding what, what you're trying to build for. Yeah. Uh, and then the Dropbox one takes it to this other extreme of like, um, what if we just had a brand feeling <laughs> and a manifesto and how do we make that look weird? And the answer is pink and blue. Yeah. Just put pink <laughs> and blue and then pink and green and then purple and yellow and it's like it's really funny because this makes like strategists like flip out they're like oh i love this this is so cool and it's like no it's just a bunch of dumb shit so so bleep <laughs> uh so i thought i so I, I i had never seen the dropbox one before and i thought dropbox.com can't look like this and then i go there and it totally looks sure enough, like this it looks like this yeah it's so totally- clearly they have made a component library based off of this but also it's totally just for yeah yeah uh the other one that i think is similar to that is the atlassian component library they have yeah. they have a little bit more substance behind theirs but not yeah. much more um yeah so that's interesting too so the other thing that i would like to say about this is you mentioned having a designer and you take the designer's design and you sort of break it up into components. And all I can say to that is, isn't that nice? (laughs) Yeah. I I, I don't know if you heard, but I'm not a designer and designing things requires you to sort of be a designer. Um, Or at least to have a design mindset for a particular amount of time. Yeah. And then return to a, a engineer's mindset. And, to do the other half of and it. I, yeah. don't, I don't really design any amount of the time. I just I just pretend to know what I'm talking about. So the what what ha- what's happened is we we've uh, been looking for inspiration wherever we can find it, and so like, oh, that looks like a nice design. Let's put that in. Yeah, and that's it's it's good, but it's not great. Um, and the final thing, it's not consistent at all. It's it's not consistent in its like we'll make it consistent. Uh, you know, in terms of how it's, you know, what what the usage philosophy and principles are, but right. its sourcing isn't consistent. A single designer or a team of designers isn't helping us say like, this is what we should do. Um, the final thing that I'll say about this is uh, choice paralysis. Yeah. So we have all heard about uh, the the age old debate for the last two years of CSS and JS. And uh, we're 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 still there, so I I wanted to stay away from it for a while because I don't right. trust it right now. It's um, kind of in flux. There's no no good choice. Um, and what we figured was we we don't even know what we're doing. So whenever we release one o, there's going to be a two after it. So in version two, we can have a nice. If we want it, then we can have a better uh, CSS and JS solution we can make design tokens and you know all these things that don't have a real standard yet maybe they'll be better by then uh, but for now totally. sas is good enough yeah i was going to ask you is there like a priority with you all to like you know clearly if you're doing a react app yep. or a modern app in another framework yep. you won't have to care about whether it's css and js or not yep for the most part yep but if you have like a legacy app yep. call it uh, i don't know uh JSP. It, it, JSP. Yeah, sure. That's a good. That's a good one. Say, say you have a JSP app. Is there something? Is there a push or any sort of urgency towards getting this design system implemented across those legacy apps, and any sort of reasonable time frame? Yeah. So. Or. Yeah. I don't know for sure if that's a push today, 
uh, there has been talk about skinning some of the documentation tools that sure. teams have used. And so I think it's called MK Docs, and you know you, it's, yeah. you you give it Markdown and it generates Docs. It's great. Um, Perfect. But in order to make skins for that, you probably won't have a whole lot of JavaScript going into it. You'll probably just have the ability to change markup and CSS files in that markup. So totally. Whatever we end up making for you know just plain viewing, uh, whatever that ends up being has to be good enough. Um, and so it's a, it's kind of a weird. Um, you know, weird split between static uh, page layout and control and uniformity, but also enough flexibility for an application to be used eventually. Totally. Uh, you know, when you have your Create React app, use it. So Absolutely. it's uh, like, it's all I can think of when I'm doing this work is like, Are you sure you want to be doing this? Like, this is going right. to take a while. Are you sure you know that? I don't know if you know that yet. I get you. Yeah. Everyone wants it now, and they want it to be high quality, and it takes an immense amount of work and really tight coupling of the engineers and designers to make it consistent and usable and accessible. Whoa. Um, That's unheard of. Or you can just yeah. put two very high contrast colors together and um, <laughs> totally put, 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 put an absurd statement in there. Well, but you also need uh, to have... And it'll be great. You need to have a custom font with the word grotesque in it. <laughs> exactly exactly yeah yeah um yeah i've i've been hearing about a uh, component library as well um at my my place of work and um i'm not super involved with it so i really can't say or shouldn't say too much but um it's just been interesting hearing how they're approaching it and how it's changed just from idea to where they are now and where it might go in the future and yeah. how and how fast they want it it's just like I don't know. It's, yeah, it's going to, I think it's, I personally think it's going to be more work than anyone realized. Oh, and yeah. And it's uh. not going to be, you know, if if it's built with React in mind, it's going to not work for so many applications right away. Well, and that's the other thing that I told my team. Like, we all know, we all, we all love React today. Totally true, 100% on board. React might not last three years. We have no way to know. So do we really want right. to box ourselves in today 100% with a React version? So for our first version, we're focusing on more of a CSS first approach. Um, we'll make we'll work on the component library for sure, but uh, if we can accomplish it with simple CSS, we will do that first. Yeah, that way you can use it when Elm takes over the world in in six months or, to or three Phoenix years. Phoenix Live View. I mean, the world could change. You never know. Yeah, yeah. And so our our older component library or design system, which um, wraps around Bootstrap three. Um, was nice because it worked on all these old sites. Yeah. And there's generally a bootstrap component library implemented for any major framework today. And so you just use that. And since it all uses the same class names, you get a component library without having to invest in it at all. Yep. And it's styled to look like how it should. And that's an interesting way of doing it too. Yep. But then you're locked into it, things looking a little more bootstrappy or materially or yeah. something like that well and that's and, and that is a was a concern of mine so we we did not pick bootstrap to base ours off of and we 100 percent uh looked in the direction of material and then found the opposite direction and walked that way <laughs> there you go <laughs> so uh we actually um seem to be picking up pieces of bulma uh if not all of it yeah <laughs> eventually see that's that's funny. That's funny you mention it. I've been using Bulma recently on a website for a new meetup, yeah. and I've I've only had very minimal needs, and I've found it to be both awesome and also really, really, really confounding. It is um, for reasons that I'll discuss in a moment. Yes, it's uh, it's an interesting small uh, like three quarters framework. Yeah, uh, that's a good is, way to put it. Which is interesting. Um, and so, like, one of the first things that we wanted to do was, you know, like, how do we want to make our grids? Okay, well, right. I don't want to have to personally code grids because, like, that sounds like a lot of work. Let's look right. at how Bulma made their grids. Oh, well, let's just use Bulma grids. Okay, great. Um, but one of the things Bulma doesn't have is a bunch of helper u- utility classes. So right. how does Bootstrap handle utility helper classes? Okay, uh, I guess we'll just use those and we'll put those in. So it's been uh, a weird combination of things. Totally. 
Totally indeed. Yep. One of the things, actually, I'm kind of intrigued about this. Uh, did you ever run into any, like, browser-specific issues with Bulma? Uh, not that I know of. Probably because y'all just tested it in Chrome? Yeah, 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 totally. That's fair. So, I do most of my development with Firefox, which I think I've mentioned here before nowadays. Yes. Me too. Um, so, all, all of my stuff is in Firefox, and I built up this nice website for the meetup, and I sent it over to Eve, my co-organizer for serverless. And she was like, this looks like shit. Sorry, bleep again. <laughs> um, and uh, and I was like, I was like, no, it doesn't. It looks great. Here, have a screenshot. And she, and she sent me a screenshot of her Android phone in Chrome. And I was like, oh, wow, that does look awful. Um, in Chrome on phone. In Chrome. In Chrome. So I have no clue what, what the problem was. It looked great on my iPhone and Safari. It looked great in Firefox. Uh, and sure enough, I downloaded Chrome for the express purpose of trying this out because, of course, I don't have um, I don't have Chrome on my iOS device, and even if I did, it wouldn't matter because it's still Safari. Yep. Um, but uh, or still WebKit at least. Uh, and sure enough, it still it still looked like trash, and uh, I ended up basically rebuilding the site with Chrome open because I figured, um, perhaps incorrectly, that Chrome would you know if I made it look good in Chrome. A, apparently 80% of the world, 90% of the world uses Chrome nowadays. Yep. Um, and apparently Chrome has diverged enough from Firefox and Safari that Firefox and Safari are more in agreement than Chrome. Yeah, um, I, I would uh, I would be interested in seeing what, what the difference between the two versions really was because that does sound like a terrible thing. Yeah, yeah, it was very it was very disappointing. I think I have commit history to back it up, but I'm not 100% sure of that. What was it? Layout, spacing... It was layout mostly. Um, let me see if okay. I can find. I don't. Was it so just, I cleaned um, up my screenshots. Was it just regular Weird. flexbox or we trying grids? Uh, I think I was trying grids. That oh, might have had something that, to do. That with was it. your first <clears throat> mistake. That was my first mistake. I'll use um, grids in like six years. As soon as IE eleven support is God. end of life. Yeah. Yeah. But I, yeah. So basically, I, I rewrote it. So the first time around, I was just using their container primitives, yep. and then, um, and now I'm actually using. Uh, their columns system. Okay. Yeah. Um, and the the wacky thing is, uh, it it actually it looks pretty solid in mobile. It looks pretty solid in tablet. Um, but basically, I've had to use different font size classes. Yes. For different things, which is very odd to me. So hmm. that um, that is one of the weaknesses of Bulma, at least today, in my opinion. They don't yeah. in the documentation. They don't extensively define. You would think that if you put uh, is size one on an element, it will be the biggest thing ever forever. Uh, yep. But they and don't. It's not. But they don't scale up based on breakpoint. No. Nope. For some reason, uh, and then that's yeah. why you have to do the is size one touch nonsense. In my opinion. Yep. Um, yeah, I'm not I'm not totally sure why they. Uh, I mean, I, I'm totally fine doing that. Uh, I just yeah. wish there were some more prominent uh, explanation in the docs. Totally, I wish I knew. I wish I knew why I had to do it. I mean, I know why I have to do it, but I wish they gave a rationale that would at least make me feel comfortable with doing it yeah. beyond like me looking at it and seeing. Well, this is how I have to do it to make it work. But yeah. that's basically what what ended up happening. Um, but yeah, the the serverless website is or the server serverless MN website is. Uh, if if you haven't seen it yet, it looks very much like somebody spent an hour on it, which is true. Somebody spent an hour on it like six times. Uh, <laughs> That's six hours, by uh, the way. Yeah, but you know, yeah. um, but that's fine. It's uh, uh, it is all static right now. It's uh, rendered with uh, Zite now. Yes. Um, nice. And I should probably, before I go too much further, describe what this thing actually is. Um, so Eve Poschel and I are starting a meetup for serverless technologies, uh, in town. Um, and she got one of her designer friends to make this super sweet, uh, angelic server logo. Um, super cute. I, uh, also, I, I, I'd recommended that we did like, a um, I don't know if you guys have ever seen this, but like, um, they're all, I, when I was in Seattle, I saw all these like punk t-shirts, uh, in, uh, just in Seattle, but also particularly at the Museum for Pop Culture, uh, Museum of Pop Culture there, and they had one that was like "I'm more punk than you," and then they had this like crude drawing of somebody like with a with a hatchet, and like me, 
like the arrows pointing at one person that was like me and then the other one was like you and it's like ha i've got the hatchet because i'm more punk than you and i was like we should do one of those but like with servers and like it's just us with hatchets chopping into servers and she was like yeah i think i think i could do that and then this this is what her designer came up with which is not that which was slightly disappointing um (laughs) but it's still a really great logo in some Um, ways this might have been better (laughs) In some ways, this might have been better and probably more approachable to people who are not Eve or I. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, you know, but Brandon, uh, yeah, no, no more servers. I have to ask, are there servers? Uh, there are servers. They're just not yours. Oh. They're somebody else's. But why is it called serverless then? Because uh, they're not your servers. They're somebody else's servers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's, it's fun stuff. That's the uh, joke that everybody goes through on every single yep. Hacker News page that mentions the word serverless, serverless. or Lambda. That's fair. We do. We, uh, the, uh, we deserve it. Like the serverless <laughs> community deserves that, deserves to be, deserves that joke until yeah. the end of time, I feel like. Yeah. Uh, it's just, it's just our burden to bear. Yep. Um, but uh, no, it is it is it is really cool, and we're really excited. We locked in an awesome speaker who's uh, an AWS uh, cloud architect and um, is, is speaking all over town about this stuff, literally and figuratively. Uh, Lynn Langett, who uh, is actually going to be in town for NDC, uh, oh. which starts in a couple days, and she's going to give a talk about um, like serverless architecture patterns at NDC. And um, I was talking to her a couple months ago about maybe having her stop by JSMN, um, but she was kind of like, ah, that's not really my scene. Um, but then when I told her we were starting up a serverless meetup, she's like, oh, yeah, I'd totally be there. And she's going to be in town for that, too. So cool. that's great. Super I'm exciting. Looking forward to it. I'll yeah, it's going to. It's going to be all about relational databases with uh, with serverless, which is I know a big pain point for me. So there's um, um, so it's going to be super there's exciting. at least twenty days before this 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 serverless meetup happens. At least, uh, can you tell us the date and location of this event? That's true. Uh, it's going to be May twentieth uh, at MentorMate in beautiful historic Uptown Minnesota, uh, mm. right at the intersection of Lake and Hennepin. Nice. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, uh, that'll, that'll be, that'll be very, uh, it'll, it'll be solid. Uh, I'd recommend parking at the Calhoun square ramp if you like parking ramps. And if you don't like parking ramps, you should take the bus or bike or park on the street because there's lots of that too. Perfect. Woo. So good. Uh, Hey, we have some podcast things we want to talk about. Just, some, just, some meta just a little bit. Podcast discussion. Uh, this is yeah. just, just a cool thing that happened over the weekend. Wait, no, during the week. I don't even know what day it is anymore. Yesterday on Saturday, right? Oh man. Is it Sunday? <laughs> Who knew? Um, so uh, Marco, our good friend, Marco Armand, uh, who makes Overcast, but also who is the, uh, one of, one of the hosts on uh, ATP, uh, he made a feature in Overcast that allows you to select a portion, a minute-long portion or less, of a particular podcast episode, and it will render out a video clip for you of the album art and a little, you know, time scrabbler countdown thing. It's fake. It just counts down from when it starts to when it ends, and the title of the episode and you know whatever that great text is. I don't know what that is. Uh, and it's super cool because you can share that little clip on Twitter or Instagram or wherever people share things these days. Um, and so now on my Twitter feed here, I have seen in the past day and a half hundreds of podcast clips from ver- various episodes that I've totally listened to in the past of various things, but mm-hmm. that have been locked away in... Well, I'm not going to go listen to the whole hour-long podcast, or in the case of Hypercritical, four-hour-long podcast. <laughs> this is true. So uh, it's been super cool to see some of these. And so Marco has it just built into Overcast in the main app. You can uh, find it somehow. I don't I don't have an iPhone, so I don't know. Uh, but you can generate it in different ways. You can generate it in portrait, landscape, and square. And he talked a little bit about on Twitter about you know some of the ideas for this. And so... There was this whole long discussion recently on ATP about Luminary and yeah. its threat to the open nature of the ecosystem, which is I'm all supporting all of that. Don't don't fight fight the proprietary. Whatever you do. Uh and this is a great way to do that. Um I think there's still further things to explore, so can we in the future maybe, I don't know, um 
make a web version of this. So can, could a website generate your MP4? And I think the answer is totally probably maybe soon. Um, and so, you, <laughs> so you 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 give you you can imagine how that works. You give a website a uh, RSS feed. You pick the thing you want uh, to get um, picture uh, videoized, I guess, and then you just you just uh, throw it up there wherever you want. So it's really cool. I'm a big fan, and uh, I'm sure we'll be using it for episodes in the future. Yeah, or perhaps uh, <laughs> even in the present. <laughs> Who's to say? Who's to say? So the the question the question that I've been thinking of as we've been discussing this is is that MP4 actually generated on device? Um, I believe so. I thought interesting. So for the links at least sent out, I saw Marco was saying that it it doesn't rehost the URL. It it downloads it from the original host server and then just cuts over to the timestamp. So it wouldn't really support dynamic ad insertion uh, because good. the timestamps would be different. Yeah, which you don't even don't even bother supporting that. Um, there you go. So it's it's still, you know, counting as a download to the original uh, CDN or wherever it was hosted. Um, I don't know exactly how you can download just chunks of an MP3, but apparently you can do it really easily. Yeah, there's a, what, what is it called? It's, um, there's a, there's a tag, there's not a tag, there's a header you can send to a file and the file will begin at that file offset. Gotcha. Nice. Okay. That's solid. So See, cause like that. Yeah. See, because like what I was wondering was like if the if the video because like clearly the video is still hosted by Overcast at that link, the quote unquote video, but ultimately the audio is coming from that s- stream. I don't know. Maybe I'm not understanding this properly because it because it is ultimately still a web based. I think the no. video the video is is entirely self contained. Yes, the yeah, yeah, web based share is downloading from the original source. So nice. I can uh, I can let me put in uh, to the show notes here an example of one of these clips. I think that'll help our future yeah. uh, future audience understand exactly what's going on here. So here's a fun clip from Hypercritical, um, and it's just a what twenty second long video of a snippet of that podcast from many yeah. years ago. Huh. Okay. I, I, I think I get it now. Uh, and so, you know, there was some discussion on, so why'd you make it a minute long? And it's like, well, you know, fair use and all. And also that's how long Instagram lets videos be. So those are good reasons. Yeah. And it seems like a minute long is enough. Uh, like you would know at that point, should I listen to the whole thing or not? Right. Yep. Right on. Well, good for Marco. He's definitely... It's been awesome to see over how over the past half dozen years, um, you know, I, how long has Evercast been around? Four yeah, or five years. Yeah, four or uh, five. 2013, I, I think he he announced it at XOXO 2013. That's right. Oh, good old XO. I watched that talk like a week ago <sighs> nice. for the first time. Pretty good. Yeah. XO is a great place to launch a product, too. Uh, wistful XOXO noises. <laughs> um... <laughs> But yeah, no, that's 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 great, um, and it's awesome to see that Marco has kind of uh, taken up that kind of uh, role in the podcasting community, or at least in this little area of the podcasting community, this little slice of it. Yep. Um, because you know, uh, we need it. We sure do. Uh, well, I've got a little Apple news to share, or ostensible Apple news to share. Um, our friends at Nine to Five Mac. Uh, uh, have uh, described some rumors around uh, what sort of things might be coming across in uh, a WWDC this year. Uh, and, and just before you get into what you're ta- going to talk about, yeah, they've they like released daily for a week or two something new, and I think it was uh, Guy Rambo and some help from Steve Trotton Smith and. Those two have been on fire. It's seriously nuts the amount of details they have. Pretty wild indeed. Yeah, they're they're uh, they're really uh, on top of it. Uh, so a couple of the things uh, that they kind of mention in this post are um, some new Siri intents um, that uh, folks who are building apps can uh, kind of implement to handle media playback, search stuff like that, which is all kind of uh, uh, you know 
somewhat basic things, but um, you know, it's going to be interesting to see how developers uh, kind of attack that. Uh, Steve Troughton Smith uh, has been really keen on these uh, marzipan improvements. Uh, in particular, he's got a lot of really awesome uh, threads over the past couple of weeks around kind of messing around with marzipan and um, kind of seeing and playing around with how um, Mac OS uh, is, is going to kind of handle that as, as things go on here. I'm not, I'm not super in tune with that, but I think it's really exciting some of the stuff he's been working on. The things that I'm really excited about are AR changes and then NFC stuff that, that is ostensibly coming down the pike. Um, on the AR side, um, there's been some kind of mention of software support for um, stereo AR headsets, um, which is kind of wild. And like the, th the thing about stereo AR headsets that's kind of interesting is that usually that's, that implies perhaps the existence of new hardware, possibly new first party hardware. Um, yeah, which like who knows for sure. Um, but AR kit, particularly on the software side, is going to get some improvements uh, according to 9to5Mac. Um, around uh, detecting uh, human poses and um, you know it's, it's kind of a, a foregone conclusion that there'll be some improvements to like depth detection, vertical plane detection and stuff like that. Um, the interesting thing though is going to be that new hardware. There's a third party uh, solution that I'm trying to remember the name of right now that basically you can glue onto a Rift or a HTC Vive that basically gives you a stereoscopic camera um, right here on your forehead. Sorry, right here is a great thing to say on a podcast where you know, can see <laughs> where I'm pointing. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, and basically, it, it'll allow... There, there's some really cool demos of people building things with that. Um, however, uh, you know, on the iOS side, that's not, really, that's not really a thing. And you have to kind of buy into the whole VR ecosystem in order to even start with that. But um, once you do, the results are pretty stunning. So... Uh, as, as much as that can move more towards platforms that I develop for, I'm very excited for that. <laughs> um, the other side of that is NFC changes, and this is going to be pretty massive because uh, right now there's kind of some limitations on what sort of NFC tags you can read or um, or access uh, from uh, from iOS apps. Yep. Um, so now they're going to allow, uh, or it's rumored that they're going to allow. Um, uh, ISO 7816 uh, Felicia by Felicia or uh, Mi Fair tags, um, uh, uh, which is going to be super exciting because that really opens up uh, things to a lot of uh, a, a lot of possibilities for like uh, how people might do like ticketing and access control or event management stuff, which is kind of my jam right now. Um, uh, which you know currently you can't really do so that's going to be kind of fun uh, and then lots of other vision framework stuff document scanning things are rumored um which will just make life uh real fun for us ios developers in the near future and all we need is somebody to make react native bridges for it and uh all of a sudden uh all of a sudden i'll actually be able to use it <laughs> nice fun stuff hey speaking of react native uh in the past couple days uh there have been some tweets from folks uh, including evan bacon who works for expo uh, implementing my favorite iOS game, uh, Crossy Road, uh, in React Native, and then hosting it on the web, because apparently uh, he's working on some Expo support for React Native web that uses those React Native um, UI primitives um, and renders to the DOM. So uh, I put a link in the show notes there. It's kind of a fun thing to check out. Um, it's a little buggy, but it's mostly just really cool. Um, so there you go. That's uh, Brandon's iOS development corner right there. That is nice. Well, shall we? Shall we get to some Twitter followies? I think we shall. Uh, let's see. Uh, I followed like fifteen thousand people uh, <laughs> since we last recorded. Yeah. Uh, but here are some of the highlights. Uh, first one is Andrew Ripka uh, at R I P P M N. Uh, he spoke at the DevOps meetup uh, a couple nights ago, uh, and he gave a really interesting talk on um, how to create kind of a um, a serverless platform in house using the Knative series of primitives for Kubernetes. Um, yeah, and it was really interesting. Even though I'm never going to do that, um, see that because, today. Uh, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I can't. I can't 
possibly uh, uh, I would I no nah it's all right I, I just won't but it was really interesting because he spoke about a lot of the things that I've I found to be kind of pain points with using Kubernetes um, and other sorts of platforms when I have tried to r- roll my own and the pain kind of point version of the stuff of using Kubernetes is using Kubernetes right hey how'd you know well, yeah I, I firsthand experience. Exactly. Exactly. Um, but yeah, there, um, he's also just seems like a really cool guy to follow. Um, uh, works for Google, uh, lives in town here, which, uh, you know, there aren't, aren't a ton of folks who work for Google and still live in Minnesota. That's so, cool. um, always, always good to know about those folks. I like um, this picture that he shared here from somebody else, old arrow, new projects to products, waterfall to lean, <laughs> whatever I T I L is to CICD, Java E oh. to Spring Boot, and Batch to Streaming. Hmm, yeah. Yeah. I, I See, I don't know that ITIL yeah. and CI and CD are compatible, but I don't know. That's fun. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, yeah, that's maybe not the best uh, introduction to how cool he is, because he is, he is quite cool. No, no, I liked but, it. <laughs> yeah, it's a funny... Uh, oh, and he is speaking at Open Source North, too, so cool. for those of you headed to Open Source North, you can see him talking about Knative again Very at, good. Uh, at Open Source North, so that's fun. Uh, next up is at NerdBlurt, uh, who is in town for a little while. His name is uh, Luigi uh, Danakos. I uh, apologize. I probably butchered that pronunciation there. Um, but uh, Luigi is in town uh, for an event and possibly has just left, but he was asking about where the best chicken wings in town are. And I told him uh, to go to the Monte Carlo because that is where the best chicken wings in town are. Um, and I, I will uh, ex- accept no substitutes. So um, does he just go around to various speaking engagements and look for chicken wings? Because there are pictures yeah. in his picture list of chicken wings. Uh, oh, yes, absolutely. Um, and um, that's 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 a good enough reason to follow somebody in my book. Perfect. Uh, which is perhaps why I follow so many people. Um, the next one is Thursday What a Concept. Uh, which is a bot that tweets the screenshot of the Netflix series Russian Doll. Ah, uh, um, yes. Uh, where she says, Thursday, what a concept. Every Thursday. Um, it's very helpful uh, to remind me what day Thursday is. <laughs> wow. um, because, uh, you know, sometimes it's hard, it's hard to know. Um, and then last but not least is, um, I don't know if you guys have heard of this guy. Uh, his name is Mark uh, Dalglish. Dalglish? Um, yeah, yeah, I, I think, um, you know, uh, he's kind of gaining some popularity for doing uh, some JavaScript memes on the internet. Uh, and we definitely haven't mentioned him once each uh, for each of the past three episodes of PodKit. Um, <laughs> because if we had, you know, that would have been, that would have been a thing that maybe we would have discussed perhaps even on the last episode of PodKit. And or in totally the have planned this segment. Yeah. I definitely didn't put a Slack reminder to, uh, to say, Hey, put Mark, Mark Dalglish uh, and your Twitter followees on the next podcast so that we can continue the running joke. Um, but that concludes my Twitter followees. Who have you followed since we last spoke, Brian? Uh, I've followed actually quite a few people, like probably a dozen, which is way more than I'd like to. I'm almost at 500 again, even though I just nice. recently cut down to the 470s. Um, so first here I have, uh, Sunil Pai, who's at 3.1. He's on the React Core team, um, out of London, and uh, he, he's been doing a lot of stuff on, like, the asynchronous act that I kind of touched on very briefly um, earlier in the, in the episode. Um, yeah. He was featured on the Undefined podcast or the React podcast recently in the last couple of weeks. So I give that a listen, too. Uh, next up is Brian Vaughn, another React Core team member. He's been working on the React Dev Tools recently, so I've been seeing lots of tweets about that. Um, because those dev tools are going are being rewritten entirely, and they're looking pretty good. And they're nice. using they're using uh, some experimental suspense tech in those dev tools as well, which is pretty cool. Uh-oh. Okay, cool. So they're probably using it as a proving out ground too. I believe so. Nice. Yeah, I'm gotta, definitely excited for that. Got to dog food it. Yeah. Um, next up is testing lib. Uh, this was created like three days ago mm-hmm. um, nice. did a little bit of reorganization for all of the dom testing library react testing library uh what else was there puppeteer testing library cypress testing library etc um basically kenzie dodd's testing suite of uh things dom things oh so is the, things. are all of these kcd <laughs> products um i don't think all of them are no 
But they're um, all kind of following that same format. Same, yes. same kind of patterns. And yeah, I think they pulled in a couple more repositories. The, uh, um, the principle they, of the methodology of testing is what is similar across all of these. Gotcha. Simple and complete testing utilities that encourage good testing practices. I also followed this account, but I didn't put it in my list because it wasn't a person. Yeah, I thought, yeah, yeah, it's not a person, but I don't know. I followed it. It seems kind of related to this podcast, so why not? Yeah. Maybe a little bit yeah. here and there. I, I insta followed it. I actually hadn't heard about it, probably because I do not follow um, certain folks involved with it. So uh, <laughs> there you go. There you go. Great. Uh, and then finally is at Marvis underscore music, which is the Marvis app. It's a third-party music and Apple Music application for iOS. I've been using it for a couple of months now, and they just released version 3.0 and did a, um, a major push for marketing. Um, I think I bought it when version 2 came out, but that was kind of a soft launch for what became version 3. Um so I can now play Apple Music. It scrabbles to last FM, which I love, and the interface is really great. Um, so nice, yeah. So maybe, how does it? Sorry, continue. I was gonna say, maybe you could follow the uh, developer and designer as well too. Yeah, just linked in that bio. How how does it use um, Apple? So it plays Apple Music. Yep. How how, how um, is there a public API for Apple Music? I believe so. Yes. Wow, I didn't realize that. That's pretty great. Um, so it's, it's how things like Shazam can play Apple Music or add add stuff to your library. Um, there's a there's a whole collection of third party music apps out there. I've tried a couple of them, and but Marvis seems like a really solid one. I like it a lot. There awesome. are a couple things that it can't quite do, like rating a song doesn't really get pushed back into the music app. So there are a few actions that I can only really do in the music app. But okay. Then Marvis does pick it up immediately. Um, so just for like passive listening and finding some stuff, um, it's pretty good. Interesting. I'd be interested to see what its um, uh, CarPlay support is like, too, if any. I think that's coming. It's not there yet. Okay. Okay. Well, cool. I have followed, How are you, Ryan? I have followed exactly one person. One person. Uh, nice. and, that is, and that is Chase Olson. Now, there's an extra H there, so you got to say Olson. Uh, nice. And he is a uh, web developer and front-end engineer in L.A., and um, I think I followed him because he was featured on the um, Gatsby retweet Twitter account. I don't know. Nice. And um, his new Gatsby website is pretty cool, and uh, I was poking through it the other day, so he's pretty cool. That is super cool. Yep. Um, speaking speaking of Gatsby, I should throw out there at some point. Uh, we had a really awesome talk at JSMN last week um, by Janessa White, um, an awesome front end dev in town uh, who uh, kind of walked us. Oh, sorry, I just automatic. I just auto played it. Um, darn YouTube and its autoplay. Um, but we did. Uh, I, I actually kind of understand a little bit more about how the GraphQL stuff works as a result. Very good. Which has always been kind of a pain point for me, at, in addition to all of the weird Kyle, what's his name, libraries. Kyle Matthews. Yeah, Kyle Matthews adding all of his stuff that breaks everywhere. Um, <laughs> That's to, not documented. Uh, to my website. Yeah, if it's not documented, and um, I don't really know why. Well, maybe 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 I've discovered why typography JS exists. Maybe it exists to solve the Balma problem, but I don't know for sure. So that's because it's not documented. I don't understand how it works. Yeah, <laughs> that makes sense, but I don't think that's why it exists, though. I'll, I'll I'll give it the benefit of the doubt and say sure, that's why it exists, even uh-huh. though I have no evidence to 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 confirm or deny that. But this does look like a really sweet Gatsby website, yeah. and I kind of want it. I kind of want to make one that's like that but I, for me. I know. And, and so the uh, source code, I believe, is available. So if you go to his GitHub uh, and you click on Chase Olson, the the website there, you can actually read all of the code for that website. And it, apparently it's being hosted on Netlify, which is pretty cool too. Uh, and it is ML, uh, MIT licensed. Yeah, so, so uh, you know. Don't it's steal, just mine don't, now. Don't, 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 don't <laughs> steal the brand, but steal, steal the methodology. Yep. Perfect. Yep. There we go. 
Yes. So it's pretty cool. I I, uh, I like I like I like following the Gatsby uh, Twitter retweeter thing. Yeah. yeah. So what do you guys have uh, planning uh, these days coming up here? What are you what are you what are you doing soon? Open source north, just writing my talk. Nice. Practicing my talk, making some open source stuff that will be released along with my talk. Maybe kind of sort of who knows. We'll find out. Nice. Um, prepping for meetups that will happen between now and then, uh, probably submitting to other conferences because at once you write a talk, then you just have to perform it a bunch of times. Yep. And yeah, so we'll see how that goes. Uh, lots of work. Um, yeah. How about you guys? Um, I will be at PubConf on May 8th, uh, which is kind of the official unofficial after party for NDC Minneapolis or nice. Minnesota. In St. Paul, Minnesota, are, are they are they hosting it at River Center again? I think so. I don't don't quote me on that. I'm not attending, so I don't know. Oh, right, 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 right. Um, let's see. Going to some going to some shows here. Seeing Closey and Yellow Claw at Skyway Theater sometime in May, May 10th, nice. and 17th. Uh, what else? There's a hackathon at my work. I might just be doing some styling. It'll be nice and relaxed. Cool. And um. Open Source North on the 22nd. That's about what I got. So good. What about you, Ryan? Um, so uh, next week or so, in the next two weeks, basically, at work we're having sort of a uh, all-dev team meetup. So from various offices around the world, we're all, all meeting up locally here. And... Um, We'll kind of be going through, like, you know, what uh, you know what our tech stick is, and how we build things, and what's the plan, and uh, just you know, knowledge sharing kind of stuff. So that'll be a lot of fun. Good stuff. Well, where can we find you two on the internet, or at, or in real life? Uh, well, you can find me just about everywhere, but especially on Twitter at Randomar, and of course on my website RyanRepresent dot com, and sometimes on um, no, that's it. No, you can't find me on Mastodon. <laughs> it doesn't exist. <laughs> Yeah, I'm kind of I'm kind of done with that too. I I did recently sign in again and post two things, and then I closed it. I gotcha. Well, you can find me uh, probably bouncing between Uptown and Downtown Minneapolis, um, which is uh, you know where I spend most of my time nowadays. Uh, probably bouncing between coffee shops, especially trying to find one that does not have a church service on Sundays, um, because uh, apparently that's a the thing. There's coffee shops with church services, which I. Which is not a problem per se. It's only a problem when I'm in search of coffee and I would rather get coffee um, and people are trying to have a church service when I need coffee. Uh, oh, but on the internet, you can find me on twitter.com slash Brandon underscore MN or uh, my website, which is branded.mn uh, or on my Instagram, which is branded underscore MN. Uh, some combination of Brandon and MN will usually get you to me um, where I post pictures of the coffee that I'm having and uh, not usually of the church that's happening where the coffee should be coming from where it's not because there's a church happening. Okay, what what coffee shop is that that has a church in it? <sighs> not to name names, but it's Corner Coffee. <laughs> okay. Interesting. Corner Coffee. It's it's very great. It's a very. It's I'm I'm glad that people have that, but um, sometimes I just need my Lord and Savior caffeine. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Uh, so instead, Dogwood it is. The heathens of Dogwood Coffee. Yum. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Brian Mitch L or my website, brianm.me. Uh, I do have an Instagram, Brian Mitch L as well. I don't post there often enough, and I really need to work on that. But that's where you can find me. Uh, you can connect with us on our subreddit, us being the Nexus TV, which is at reddit.com slash r slash the Nexus TV. Or you can give us a, a tip over on our Patreon, which is patreon.com slash the Nexus TV. Um, yeah, that's that's us. Great. Good show. So it's good. always good to hang out again after a month. Truly well, indeed. We'll schedule the next one after uh, Open Source North, of course, and we can talk all about it. Oh, perfect. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully, hopefully my talk will be done by the week after Open Source North. We'll I find hope out. so. I really do. <laughs> <laughs> okay, have a good one. Have a good one. Have a good one. The Nexus. The Nexus. The Nexus TV. Podcasts from, from the, the Technological, technological Convergence. convergence.